Here's the explanation of number five crossbar that Martin gave me at the Telephone Museum in Ellsworth, Maine. As this conversation begins, we are standing looking at part of the wall that contains the master test frame. I don't know what that part is called. It's the front of the office. It's always the thing you see in front. And there is this panel of lights that has cryptic letters under each light. And what it shows is how far the most recent call that was flagged for trouble progressed. And uh, so it will, it will light the lamps if you do something dumb. So that, that's the trouble indicator? Yeah, that's the trouble indicator. And um, Does that just leave lit up whatever the last bugaboo was? Basically, or? yeah. And then you can... You can well, let's, let's bring something up on it. So, um, and I'll try and describe what I'm doing for, for the sake of our listeners. Right. Um, I'm going to dial a non-working number on our five crossbar. And normally... Uh, in the real world, that would go to intercept. Uh, but we don't have an intercept set up yet uh, on this, so it's actually going to try and go to intercept and fail. And when it fails, it will bring up a trouble record. So um, here we go. We're going to go off hook, and I will dial 338, which is the office code of this machine, and then I'm just going to dial 1111, which is a non-working number. And you'll hear the marker. You may hear the marker from here. We'll see. Okay. So the mar marker actually did a second trial, which is what it's programmed to do if anything failed. Uh, and both the first and the second trial failed. And we can see here on the, on the lights, or, or we can see anyway, um, what it's actually telling us, if, if you could see the lights, is it failed to get a number group circuit, which is the lookup uh, because we don't have a, a lookup for that number, and that's the lack of one particular LED here. So that normally would be lit? If, yeah, if it successfully connects to a number group, this, would, uh, this LED here would become lit. And I assume this means originating register? Yeah, we have the OR light, originating register, ITR light, which means it's an intra-office call, right. uh, forward linkage, which means it's trying to go to the line that you are calling right. as opposed to the callback, which is the second part of the operation where it goes back to the line you're calling from. And uh, some lights here that indicate some general progress in the marker, uh, various things it's trying to do. And it kind of gets stuck because um, it's unable to uh, get, a, uh, get a number group for that particular number. Okay. When you said this means it it tried to go to a, it tried to go to a terminating line in the office. Is that what yes, it? yeah. There's on, on a on a number five crossbar. There's on a call within the same office. There are two parts. Um, the the first part is it tries to go to the the terminating side of the connection. And that's called the forward linkage. Right. Uh, the number you are calling calling that is. Um, and it just goes and makes sure that the line is uh, a real number and that it's not busy and you really can complete a call to that. Of course, in this case, we can't, but, uh, but anyway. And then once it's got that side of the call set up, um, it does what's called the callback, which is... Uh, so, the, the, so the forward side of the call is uh, connecting an intra-office trunk to the line you are calling through the switching network. And then the second part is the callback, which is the connecting the line you are calling from through the switching network to the intra-office trunk. And then once you've done that, the call is complete and ringing will be applied to the line. So the linkage that got you the originating register, is, is that complete, that's completely abandoned? Yes. And, then it, and that's called the callback yes. when the intra-trunk gets a connection to you. Right. And so what, it's like, I'm going to keep this intra trunk. Right. And now we're going to figure out how to get from that back to the line that's making the call. Right. And just before it does that, it drops the originating register connection. Gotcha. Okay. It actually, it's interesting because it still keeps the, in, the originating register connected to the marker at that point because if that callback operation fails, it will do a second trial. 
So it doesn't actually completely release the OR, the originating register, until everything is completely done. Uh -huh. So there's sort of a two-step release process so there, if you like. So the marker doesn't... It doesn't independently hold the information of the number you're calling. No, that's held. It's held in the OR in for the as OR. long as the marker, and then when yeah. it no, then it drops the OR. Right. Oh, so it's using the OR as a register for the benefit of the marker. Yes. During that connection. Time. Exactly. And uh -huh. in fact, what what is supposed to happen is if if you do a second trial, um, it's supposed to try and grab a different marker on the grounds that the marker may be the Maybe thing that's at fault or here. Yeah. Oh, it's got a bad relay or whatever. Oh, wow. It really, there's some, well, as we go through this, I'll try and point out some of those features. Second try, sorry. So the OR has seized one marker. Right. And if it feels the need to do a second trial, then the OR is supposed to get another marker. Yeah, in fact, if the marker, it's the marker that kind of tells the... Tells There's, the OR to try again? Yeah. Or? Actually, it, there's, a, there's a piece in between, which is called the marker connector. All right. And the ORs are connected through this marker connector, that, and the marker connector has a whole bunch of multi-contact relays, which has how it connects all the various leads from the OR to the marker. And if the marker gets unhappy, it'll go back to the connector and say, hey, this didn't work. We need a second trial here. It operates some relays in the connector. The connector releases the first marker, right. and there's a kind of a flip-flop circuit that makes it try a different marker the second Jeez. time. These guys thought of everything. <laughs> oh, it's it's just amazing. Yeah, and of course we only have we only have one marker here. We're we're not so rich, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so it always comes back to the same marker. One question I, I have, well, it's a little, I, I, I want to ask this because otherwise I'll forget. It's not necessarily germane here. We've noticed the older number five crossbars that have mostly wire spring markers. That's the older one? Flat spring is the older Flat one. Flat spring is the older. Okay, yeah. Bill told me backwards the first time. Okay, yeah. Flat spring is the older. Yeah. They but it's have, actually quite a, it's quite a small, small percentage. Um, I think they, they built about, it's around 2,700 five crossbars total. And they only actually ever built about 500 with flat springs. Really? So from what I understand from reading the History of Engineering and Science book, and so most of them are wire spring. Interesting. Yeah. Well, the, the older number five crossbars have one connecting noise. Mm -hmm. that we hear most of the time, and then maybe one out of ten times we hear the new connecting noise. Mm. The new number five crossbars make the new connecting noise every time. Right. And Bill got the impression that it had to do with, you know, whether you happen to get a flat, well, if you were in an office that had a mix. Right, whether which you the were some, the flat, yeah. The flat spring or the, or the wire spring. Right. But then again... I don't know if that's really what makes the connecting noise what it is. I mean, yeah. it might be modern versus older type trunk outgoing trunk circuits. Right. Or something. Was yeah. this was this on um, on intra office calls, outgoing calls, or didn't it? The the fundamental noise is the same on intra and mm -hmm. outgoing. Right. Uh, but what I'm describing is for the outgoing calls. Okay. But it, I can tell you that. I don't have enough samples of intra calls to mm. see if the same statistics okay. follow. Yeah. See whether yeah. one out of ten does right. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but maybe I'll have to go to see what Seattle says because I think they've got a, fl a flat spring and a wire spring. Got bits of both, I think. Yeah, yeah, and see if it uh, see if yeah. it corresponds to the noise. Right. Um, you've 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 had a chance to make a call and listen to ours. I hope have you? Let me let me listen to it now. Yeah. This one? Um, both of them, but because of the way we do touch tone on here, just do this one for now. Okay. Uh, three three eight six five three two. Yeah, that's the that's the newer sound. Right. Yeah, yeah and this is this is all wire <laughs> uh, all wire spring. This one we don't have any flat spring stuff in the. Apart from a few little bits here and there that they never bothered to update when the wire spring relays came along.
Dang. Okay. I'm yeah. glad to get that straight. It's a very when I when I moved to the U.S. in 1981, I was on a five cross bar for about a year, and <laughs> this sounds exactly the same, actually, <laughs> which is quite comforting in a way. You know, you know it's odd the um, the Ericsson crossbar that I saw in Mexico mm -hmm. has a very similar connecting sound. Mm -hmm. And then there's even another one. The, 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 there's a pentaconda right. that makes the same sound as the flat spring sound. Yeah, I think all of, those, all of those crossbar machines, I believe, were similar in that um, when you connected to a register, it was kind of like the same thing as going to an outgoing trunk and then there was this, it dropped and did a call back. Yeah. So what you're hearing when you hear that sound is the OR dropping and the reconnection being done to the trunk. That's, that's I think, what that characteristic noise is. How about that? Yeah. So that is what makes it characteristic. It's the callback. Yeah. See, that's something I just never thought about. Mm-hmm. You know, I just... Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a two... It's da-da. Yeah. The first... Uh, yeah. is the register dropping, and the second one is the connection to the trunk. Right. Yep. Yep. Way cool. Yeah. Let me make sure that thing is still behaving. Sure. Uh, yes, looks good. Okay, okay. I, just, I get paranoid because yeah. it's a, it's a modern it. device, i.e. you can't <laughs> trust it. You're right, yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, let's go... Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, sort of, yeah, step me through here. Step me... Uh, excuse me. Uh, crossbar... <laughs> cross me through, through. right. <laughs> Um, there's not much to see here, but this is where... Not much to see? Well... This is, this is a beautiful sight. I'm looking it at is. a wall of... It's a wall of crossbar number switches. Number five crossbar type crossbar switches. Um, this, is where, this is the line link frame. So this is where everything comes in. Um, we have um, a, what's called a basic line link frame. Um, which is uh, 290 lines, and we have one extension frame which gives us another 200 lines. So in theory, we can go up to 590 here. Um, right now, the extension link frame is not wired into the basic frame, so we really only have 290 uh, possible lines. Right. Um, A dumb question: Does each of these um, individual Verticals correspond to a line. Yes. Um, or a potential line. Yeah. So. Except for the last one, that's no test. Well, <laughs> so actually, the left-hand side of this um, of this switch here, and we're looking at a, a 10 by 20 crossbar switch. The left-hand side is what they call the juncta switch. So this is this is sort of in two parts. So this the left-hand side is kind of logically separated from the right-hand side of this of the switch. So it's sort of like you had two separate physical crossbar switches, and these, these two sides are all interconnected in that sort of standard crisscross pattern that you will see if you go and look at a textbook on crossbar switching. Ah, okay. Um, right. Then the right-hand side is actually where we have, on each switch, we have ten lines, or actually nine, because as you so rightly point out, the first one right here is what we call the no-test vertical, which is used for verification and test calls. Uh -huh. So we've got nine here, and if we look on the right side of this bay, uh, we've got another 10 here and a 10 here, so that's nine, 10, and 10 is 29, and we have 10 horizontal groups, as they're called, so times 10, that's how we get our 290. All right. And, and where do these go? Just okay, so, so these, the, on the juncta switch, is what we're looking at now. We have 10 links from each, or up to 10 links on each one. And that goes to the trunk link frame, and that's the other part of the switching network in a number five oh, crossbar. Okay. Now, is this, um, these are serving as the juncters for this group of lines plus those? Yes. So on the right-hand side, the, the horizontals are multipled. So we have a group, uh, for each horizontal group, we have 29 lines, uh, and that can access up to 10 junctures, which would go to our trunk link frame. Gotcha. And that's, that's, the co that's how the concentration happens at this stage. So it's gotcha. 2.9 to 1, if you like numbers. Gotcha, I see. And you can use all 10. 
Yeah. Yeah, because that's how many horizontals you have. Exactly. Gotcha. So it's basically uh, 30 to... Uh, 30, to, 30 to 10. 30 to 10. Yeah. 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 And in fact, they would, they would in some offices, they would, they would multiple these out, you know, so we could put the extension on, that gives us another 20, so that's uh -huh. up to 590, so it's now 5.9 to 1. And there were even more in some offices, they would take them out even farther. Um, one of the things, one of the problems I believe they had with 5 crossbar in latter days, as call volumes increased, the loading on the horizontal groups became too much. So that 5.9 to 1 or 6.9 to 1 or whatever it became, it was just too much, um, particularly with regard to the balance between the horizontal groups. Um, they had to be careful that they didn't put, you know, too many business subscribers who might be making a lot of calls mm -hmm. into the horizontal group um, because now you, you run the risk of blocking and I think that was one of the things that put the nail in the coffin, as it were, of number five, because it would be a lot of work to balance the groups, as with all the churn between subscribers coming and going. Mm. They had to be very careful about where they placed them. They had to know something about the characteristics of the line. So if you had a business subscriber who might be making a lot of calls, you can't put them in a hole... With other yeah, with, with you know, other, yeah. Macy's or Sears or somebody yeah. like that because yeah, yeah. they're going to be making a lot of calls. And what year did that become apparent that it was a problem? I, I believe I've seen an article about that, maybe in the Bell System Technical Journal. Sometime in the, maybe the late 70s or the early 80s, they were looking at this. Hmm. Like, so that's a little before the use of the widespread use of modems. Yes, yeah. yeah, and of course that would be another factor. That yeah, because they're now all the, all the people who you thought were little old ladies are now on the phone all day, and there goes one of your, there goes yeah. one of your channels. Exactly, yes, yeah, right. yeah. That's right. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, good to, it's good to see this, because I knew it was something like this, but I never, you know. Mm -hmm. so, where, so where do these things lead to? They, does it, that leads over to a trunk link? Each yeah. of these leads to something on a... On a trunk link. On a trunk right. link. Frame. Yeah, right. So, uh, so there are 10... There are 10 junctors coming out of each horizontal group on our line link frame, and we have 10 horizontal groups, so that's 100 junctors. Um, in a, in a, if we look at the sort of the easy numbers, which would be a, what we call a 10 by 20 office, that's 10 trunk link frames and 20 line link frames. The trunk link frames could accept 200 junctors. Um, so if you sort of do the math here, what you find is that each line link frame would have 10 junctors to each trunk link frame. And that was sort of the highest density. If you had uh, an office, let's say, half that size, 5 by 10, there would be 20 junctors from each line link frame to each trunk link frame. All right. How, In, how much smarts and stuff has to be in between the line link frame, you know, how much has how much smarts does each juncture have to have? Well, the juncture is just or a is piece it, of wire. Is it just is it just the pair? It's just tip ring and sleeve. That's right. it. Yeah. And in fact, if we look slightly to our left here, um, we see this this frame here, which is, I think, all of us agree, this is a sort of a very pretty looking frame because everything yes. is so neat and there's some interesting colours on it. Yes. Um, this is called the juncture grouping frame. And what this was used for was uh, cross connects between the line link frame and the trunk link frame. And when they would put in an office, it would be a certain size and there would be a certain way that they used this frame to cross connect everything. But as the office grew, as the town got more inhabitants and they had to add, this is where the cross connections between the two sets of frames would be made to incorporate to Looks like that's what happened here. I mean, these are wood yeah. and these are like plastic. Right. So it looks like they, they came and added to... We know this office got additions at various times. Um, this is how they would reconfigure the junctures between the two frames. Wow. Can you give me an idea of the picture of how the matrix would have to be expanded out in a case like this? Like, what did it look like before? And then how did they squeeze in more... Well, the, the easiest way to think about it is, let's say you had an office with five trunk link frames and ten line link frames, so you would have 20 junctors between 
each line link frame and each trunk link frame. Um, right. If they now increased that, let's say they doubled that in size, so 10 by 20 office, they would have to rearrange it so you, instead of having 20 junctors between each pair of frames, you now went down to 10. Mm. Now that would carry, I guess, more traffic because you will potentially more traffic, although it's the same number of junctors. Um, this is, it, I, I, you're excused definitely for not immediately. This is a very hard thing to get to wrap your head around, and certainly it's something that I had to think about quite a lot. Yes, I know there's, do a, a, lot of there's reading. a picture of the matrix that yes. I am not forming. Yeah, if you, if, you, um, if you go and reference the... Um, the articles that they published in the Bell Labs record back in the late 40s and early 50s, there's one, there's actually quite a nice article that there that tells you how it all works. Aha, uh -huh, okay. And you have, to, you have to sort of read through it a little bit, but it gives you a, a basic picture of how they, how they do it. Cool, all right. That thing up there marked juncture switch. Is that part of the logic to decide which juncture is going to get used? Um, that that totally actually refers to the whole bay. Oh, really. that refers it, to the whole bay. And it's really actually only half of this bay. Okay, gotcha. It says line, the line so, link and the juncture. It's the line switch and the juncture link. The whole thing here is the line link okay, gotcha. frame. Okay. Yeah. And we, what are the, what are all those relays? Up okay, there so um, so up the top we have. Um, one relay, one line relay for each of the uh, each of the lines like coming the lines. in. So uh, on the left-hand side here, we're going to have uh, I guess that's ten times nine, so that's ninety. And on the other side, where we have uh, two hundred lines, will be two hundred line relays. Um, and then some of the other relays you see are just some of the control circuitry for making sure the switches operate properly under command from the marker. Aha, uh -huh, all right. Part of, the, part, of, part of the logic of the office, really. And uh, so when you pick up a phone, one of those line relays will operate. Yep. Um, that will operate you know, various other relays in the logic circuit, and that will call in a marker um, to make a connection from your line to an originating register. Are you using the regular marker for that, or do you have a dial tone marker? So we have a dial tone marker. Um, so in fact, when you pick up a phone here, you will call in a dial tone marker. And that is a, pretty, a, a much simplified marker over the completing marker, and its single job in life is to connect to the OR. The yeah. OR, and that's all it does. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, once, once it's done that, it retires and is available for further calls. So gotcha, gotcha. And again, there's, there's actually, as we talked earlier, there is another piece between the line link frame and the, uh, and the marker, the dial tone marker. There's what we call a line link marker connector. Right. And like the OR marker connector, that has some smarts in it. And if there is a problem in making that dial tone connection, the dial tone marker will indicate that to the marker connector and operate some relays in the marker connector that will cause the marker connector to try again, hopefully using a second marker this time. Again, we only have a single dial tone marker. We're not so rich. Right. And, um, but it does a, a second trial. And the dial tone marker is also capable of leaving trouble records much as the completing marker is. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So you get your marker connector, uh, but it might have trouble getting you an OR. If there's, a, if there's some kind of problem, right, right the, the marker will, will time out and make a, make a second trial. Interesting. This was a pretty small office, actually, for a number five crossbar, um, but it only had two dial tone and two completing markers. Yeah, if it's got only two completing markers, I know that's small. Dial yeah. tone markers, I don't know what the numbers are. Well, they always had at least two because they always, you know, if there was yeah. ever a problem, they wanted a fallback. And also, you know, they wanted to be able to busy one out if they were doing work of some kind. Or yeah. particularly with the completing marker because 
um, you'd have to come in and change the translations from time to time as routes to other offices might change. Oh yeah, yeah, that's really important. Yeah. Uh, so they, they yeah, you know, because otherwise you'd be taking the whole thing down. Yeah. yeah so so they gotta have at least to. Yeah. They pick a time of light traffic, busy one of them out, make the changes, unbusy it out, and then repeat the process on the second marker. Wow. Okay. So what's the what's the next thing I need to? Know? So we could look around the corner here. Um, we're standing now in front of the trunk link frame, which looks uh, similar, I guess, to the uh, the line link frame. It's two rows of crossbar switches and some relays at the top for the various control functions that it does. Um, this is where all our trunks and registers connect. Um, there's, there's two sides to this. On the left-hand side, we have the juncter switch. This is where the juncters come in from the line link frame. On the right-hand side is the trunk switch, which is where our trunks and registers will connect. Um, trunks could be registers. Well, those, those are the originating registers. Trunks, uh, they might be trunks to another office. They might be intra-office trunks. Uh, for calls within the same office, or they might be service trunks. Uh, that's how busy tone is applied to a line, if the line is busy. Permanent signal. Or permanent signal, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, we have some of those. Um, and this is 20 and 20. Yeah, so in fact, on the, the left-hand side, the juncto is, is sort of divided into two parts. Um, so there could be up to 200 juncters coming in. From, uh, from the line link frame. On the right hand side there's a, the, uh, the switch is split uh, in sort of an interesting way so you can have up to 160 trunks connected to that. The bottom select bar selects an A, a or B side and then the remaining eight select bars give you um, Oh, see, I each. Know yeah. That. So when this connects, it, is it si so is it simultaneously tipping two horizontals at the same yes, time? Yes, it is. So it, it like you know it goes like. Yep, you got it. Yeah, and okay. if we can if we can see that, Rick, do you just want to go off hook for a second? It's probably, yeah, you probably you know, if we can necessarily see. Okay, so it's, it's this one here. Um, all right, so this we found the we found the horizontal magnet that's operated, and okay, so this bottom set of contacts looks like it's closed here. Okay, and at the same time, one of the others should have operated. Somewhere it's a little difficult to see, but but uh, it should be the so great either. Yeah, it should be the bottom one because the registers should all be all be on the very lowest uh, set of contacts. But anyway, yeah, it, it has this um, this A B arrangement. Okay, so each of these cross points has more contacts than you, as a practical matter, need at this stage of the game, right? Well, that's why if you that's look... That's how they can split it? Yeah, if yeah. you look, um, these are six six contact switches, so it's tip, ring, and sleeve times two. Oh, I got you, and they only need tip, ring, and sleeve for, right. each, for each outgoing trunk at this point. And what's the, actually even more interesting is if you look at the bottom set, um, the left-hand bottom half has all of the contacts and the right-hand top half, but half of them are missing on the bottom right and the bottom left. Uh, I see, you see it. that? Yeah, yeah. It's missing <laughs> the three little buttons. They yeah, save, yeah, there you go. Yeah. save some money by, by admitting the ones that they didn't need. And Very interesting. Yeah, isn't it? I don't know. I think this is more of a step-by-step -step switch. I'm not getting any time out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, your ORs don't time out. No, I'm going to tell the foreman about you. <laughs> You're the reason his ratings are so bad. That's right. Yeah, we don't have the plus the plus 130 for the timing. And in fact, um, that has a very high value resistor and a large capacitor. A lot of the capacitors aren't very good anymore. We found. Oh dear, for the t for the timeout. For the timing, yeah. So uh, we're now looking at our 
originating register, OR frame, and there's sort of three bits to this. There's um, the two bays on the right hand side here are the register themselves. This is where the, the impulses are counted and where they are stored in some read relay packs, uh, two out of five code. How much of this is one originating register? Um, let's see. So it's, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve strips high. So this is one, twelve strips. 12 strips, and then we've got each, each of these uh, two bays has four registers each. All right. um, the four on the left are the ones that are working now. The four on the right, for, for whatever reason, appear to have some problems, and I've, uh, I have yet to wire those, but four is plenty for you us. you got four working. You're, you're oh, golden, right. Use this for par yeah, parts. Yeah, parts units, right. Yes. Um, you want to hang on to it for a bit, then? Okay. Um, the, um, there's a frame here to the left, which is called the Orlum frame, which is logically part of the ORs. That's the originating register line memory frame. And what this is used for is storage of the location of the calling line. Okay, so as soon as you have an OR, it stores your line location. Right. And it needs that because when the marker goes to do the callback operation, it needs to know where it's calling back to. Uh, so the marker effectively uses this as a guide. Yeah, that's how it knows. And it's again, it's, it's lots of uh, read relay packs and uh, a lot of two out of five code uh, tells the marker. Logically, it's part of the OR. And uh, when the, the OR calls in the marker to complete the call, um, as well as the called number right. that gets passed to the OR, the location of the calling line gets passed to the marker. So, so I know they use the two out of five to to store the number you're calling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But does it is it also used to store your your um, is a two out of five code? Does that apply to your line location too? Yeah. And yeah. Pretty much. Um, in fact, if you look at these read relay packs, it stores the line location uh, and also your class of service, oh, uh, yes. flat rate, message rate, coin, PBX, etc., etc. Uh, and if you look at the, the stamped designations on these read relay packs, you will see that the five locations within each pack are marked 0, 1, 2, 4, 7. Yep. So that, that kind of tells you. Uh, it's not true of all of them. There's some, some which is, a, I guess, a one out of four code, uh -huh. zero, one, two, three. Uh -huh. okay. um, but for the most part, it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, two out of five. I remember once I was trying to record Bill on the phone. Mm -hmm. And I said, say something, you know, see if it's picking you up. And he goes... Okay, testing, zero, one, two, four, <laughs> seven, <laughs> ten. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so how many classes of service can there be? Um, the, eventually, they came out, it, uh, when they designed the office initially, uh, it was 30. Uh, they later increased that to 60, um, and then even after that, it went up to 100, and that was to, to deal with Centrex, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Centrex was never provided in this office. There were never any Centrex customers in Belfast. Oh, that's not something you want to deal with. Then. No, <laughs> it's not. I've, I've, I've looked at the documentation, and it gives me a headache just looking at the occasional word in the docs. So. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing yeah. they were able to stretch number five to do Centrex uh, as well as it's they did. It's incredible. And it needs, it needs extra stuff in the OR as well, which we don't have. In fact, in fact if you look at the ORs, um, you can see there's some blank spaces, and if you were to go around the back, you would see that those blank spaces have s relay designations stamped uh, for some of the relays that were used in the Centrex, like it had a relay when you dialed 9, it operated a discriminating relay, so it could tell the marker to handle the call differently or, or know how many digits to expect and that kind of thing. Wow. wow. Amazing. Um, and to our immediate, uh, our far left here, this is the dial tone marker. All right. 
This is a single bay. It's full of relays, a whole bunch of connection strips at the top for all the cables coming in. Um, it just does the relatively simple job of uh, connecting a calling line to an OR when, when you pick up the phone. A lot of the, if you were to look at the circuitry, a lot of it is very similar to the completing marker. It's just kind of scaled down so it doesn't do quite as much. Hmm. What, um, can you tell me something rudimentary about either the completing marker or the dial tone marker, whichever my poor brain might <laughs> get a sense as to how it does what it does? What smarts are here and what smarts are out there? So you can think about the, how it operates. Um, when it gets a, um, a request for service, um, what it does is it has, a, it has its fingers around a lot of different parts. If we think about the dial tone marker, it's probably um, easier to think about, although the basic principle of operation is, is very similar. Um, it, it has the capability to, to know, if that's a good word, um, where, where all the originating registers are on which trunk link frames. Uh, it knows which trunk link frames have uh, ORs that are idle and not being used for other calls at the time. Um, it also knows which trunk link frames are being used by other markers. Uh, it sounds a little complicated, although the, the circuitry to do that is actually relatively straightforward. Is it uh, kind of a cascading relay logic? Uh, I mean, I, I can't... It's, it's all relay logic. It's not cascading. It, it basically it has a wire from each of the trunk link frames, and if, if that trunk link frame is, um, has idle ORs, there is a ground on that lead. Ah, uh, okay. So it knows, okay, there's at least something. There's at least one. Yeah. Over here. Yeah, yeah. And, and it knows also, so that's one wire from each of your trunk link frames, and there's a second wire from each of your trunk link frames saying if there is a ground on this lead, uh, the trunk frame is currently in use by another marker. Ah, so you can't talk to it for, for the moment. For the moment, yes. Yeah. 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 So if you put those two leads together with some relatively simple logic, um, you'll come up now with a set of trunk link frames which are good candidates for you to go seize. And then how does it decide which, whether to, which foot to start walking with? Well, <laughs> so, so what it does then, it has a, a, a counter circuit in it. I call it a counter circuit. It's a, a sequence circuit. It's a group of relays, and each time the dial tone marker gets used, it it steps along this sequence of relays. So the first one operates for the first use, the second one will operate for the second use, and so on. It steps through. Um, and what that does on each use is to, is to determine which trunk link frame to look at first, if you like. Uh, so that's where it starts looking. Yes. So that now, ends up roughly distributing it well, but not exactly. Yes. So it's, yeah, it's yeah. pretty good, but yeah. <laughs> like you say, it's not, not great. Um, so now it can go out and it can seize a trunk link frame, and it, it has a connector relay, which is a, a group of multi-contact relays um, that connect the whole bunch of leads that you need to connect. Um, and and, and it, it does so, and the, the connector has a preference circuit uh, in it so that two markers can't seize the same one at the same time. Uh, so after it goes through all these steps now, it's the dial tone marker is now connected to a trunk link frame. Um, so that's the first part. And the second part is that the, the dial tone marker knows which line link frame um, has the calling line coming from it because it's been told that when the request comes in for okay. service. So it knows the frame. It knows the frame and okay. now it can it goes and connects to that frame. It can make a bid for that frame through the connector. It's possible that in the intervening period another marker got in to try and make a call, in which case it'll just wait for a brief period and then it'll it'll connect eventually. So now it has the trunk link frame, it has the line link frame. Um, if there's more than one OR 
that's idle on that trunk link frame, it will pick one of them, again using the sequence circuit, so it will tend to distribute the traffic amongst the ORs. Now is that picked from here? Or is yes, that some, okay. that's picked from here. The, the dial tone marker has some relays, some sequence relays in it, which are how does it up here. Now how does it pick from here? Uh, um. Yeah, how does it pick an OR? Good question. Um, so a trunk link frame can have up to, actually up to 10 ORs can be, you can have up to 10 ORs on each trunk link frame. Okay. Um, once the marker has connected to the trunk link frame, basically it brings back busy idle leads from each of those. There's so it's a, it, it's a connector with many, yeah, many wires. Many wires, yes. And so now the marker knows which one of those up to 10 is busy or idle. So it's got a multi-point relay mm -hmm. that when it queries is going to put extend many leads to that trunk yes. frame. Oh, yeah. But only when it needs it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. And then, if, and then when that's not there... Yeah, it's free to do that to right. some other trunk link frame. Yes, yeah. or some other marker can get into the to the yeah. same one. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, gotcha. uh, so so now it knows which of the ORs, and again it picks one based on this sequence circuit. So it it kind of rotates through every time it gets used. So it it tends to even out the traffic, and also you avoid situations where if you have a bad OR, you're probably not going to get it twice in a row. Yeah. 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 Um, so now it, it, it kind of has the, the picture now. It knows which OR, so it knows the location on the trunk link frame, it knows the location on the line link frame. Um, it now, now it has to pick a, a channel, a juncture channel to connect the two together. Uh, and again, because it has these multi-contact relays that extend all your leads between these various frames and the marker, um, it can test the sleeve lead of all the possible junctures, up to 10 junctures. Okay. So um, you're going to have up to 10 junctures available to you. Some of them may be busy on other calls. Uh, for the ones that are busy on other calls, the sleeve lead will be grounded. For ones that there's no call, the sleeve lead will have a, probably a battery potential on it from some of the hold magnets via you know, the 1500 ohm or so resistor of the hold magnet, that potential will be enough to operate one of one or more of the 10 channel test relays in the marker. All right. Um, which we can actually see here, the CHT 0 through 9. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, so now um, we will have some set of these relays will be operated uh, depending on which junctures are idle. So now, once we have an available channel, mm -hmm. we've got the trunk link, we've got the line link. Right. What else needs to happen to establish the connection? Now, the, the chat, does that imply all the necessary switches, or is there, a, I, again, I don't, I don't have a good picture. So now we have the coordinates within the switches of all the, all the, all the stuff that's idle. The marker picks one, it, it, yeah. and it does not. It does not use for the junctures, it actually doesn't use this sequence arrangement. It does something a little bit different. What it does is it always picks the lowest number one. And I don't understand the reason for this, but apparently uh, when they designed the system, they figured out that if they start at the lowest one and always start at the lowest one, it increases somehow the traffic capacity of the switch. And I'm not, it's not clear to me why that is the case, but apparently it is. Okay, uh, but we'll we'll take that as red right now. All right. So it picks the lowest one. It says, "Okay, I'm going to use that juncture," and it has, as we said earlier, it has all these leads uh, between the marker and the line link frame and the trunk link frame. Now it can operate the select magnets in all the crossbar switches because it has leads going to those. Okay. So it operates the select magnets. And then a short time after that, it can operate the hold magnets. Yeah. yeah. Once the, but once the hold magnets are operated, um, the hold magnets lock to a ground that's, that's been placed on the sleeve lead by the OR. Right. And now then it can just 
let go at that point, right? It can let go. It, it, OR it, holds it for as long as it needs to. Yeah, it actually doesn't let go quite yet. Um, it does. It does some continuity tests. Cool. It it checks that the sleeve lead is continuous both ends. It makes sure now it makes sure there's a ground coming back all the way back to the line link frame end because it can it can test that. All right. Um, it also, um, the, the other thing it does is it doesn't, it, it operates most but not all of the hold magnets. Um, it doesn't operate the hold magnet on the vertical where the line comes in yet, actually. It, and it does its continuity test before it does that. Uh, and then it operates the final hold magnet. Aha, uh -huh. okay. And now uh, it does a one more test. Um, it um, there's there's some relays in the trunk link frame that that before the before it does a final switch through of the tip and ring into the OR, it kind of diverts the tip and ring um, from going into the OR and feeds them back into the marker. So now the marker has a view of your line going out towards the telephone at the end. All right, and it does a continuity test on that to make sure we really still have a loop there and somebody is really still Somebody's calling off, still off hook. Off hook, yeah. And once, once it's satisfied with all that, then it releases that final relay in the trunk link frame and now the tip and ring are extended from your telephone all the way to the OR and the marker can now step out of the picture. I'm trying, that's great, uh, great. I'm glad, I'm glad I asked you about that. I'm trying to see why the marker would want to check the tip and ring. I mean, let me just ask the dumb question. I would, I mean, what could go wrong and why couldn't the needlessly selected OR handle it even if, what could go wrong and whatever could go wrong, okay. why can't the OR that's now the mm -hmm. needlessly selected okay, deal so. with it, albeit a little bit inefficiently, right. but okay. why is it important for the marker to okay. check that first? So, so what could go wrong is that you know you've got, you know you must have tip and ring coming in from the telephone at the other end, at least as far as your line relay right. in the line link frame, otherwise nobody would be calling for service, right. number one. But you might have a, um, a break somewhere in the juncture between the line link frame and the trunk link frame. Mm. So if one of those wires or one of the cross points is dirty and it's not getting through or something like that, you would not have continuity. You're not really testing the line out to the telephone. What you're actually testing is, is your switching the network. Air linkage. Yes. Ah, yeah. so that'll catch a bad link. Right. Oh, that's good. That's why it, was so, it worked so well. Right. <laughs> and if, if, if it discovers a problem there, well, second trial. Yeah, and it's got all the smarts to, ca to, to pr print the card if it catches it. Yes, the OR can't do that. The marker could do that. Yeah. The OR can't. So okay. I think that answers your second question. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. that explains it. Right. Okay, cool.